Hello and welcome to another edition of In Conversation. My name is Wayne Phillips from AWS and I'm joined today by Tanya Harris from Harman Cybersecurity, Tony Richards from SecureStorm and Tim Raines from AWS. Tanya, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about yourself and Harman Cyber. Yeah, I'm CEO and founder of Harman Cybersecurity and we focus on insider threat and the prevention of insider threats. So what that means is that we look at anything that may cause an employee to make an accidental mistake, um, end up with a compromised account or become a malicious threat to the business. And we look at everything involved in ensuring that we prevent that from happening rather than just leaving it to the detection stage. Great, thank you. Tony. Thanks. Um, so, SecureStorm um, and myself, we're a cybersecurity and privacy consultancy. Uh, we specialise in government tech startups, cloud-based security, and um, largely from the, around the consultancy area and testing, etc. Uh, myself, I've sort of been around doing the government work certainly for a long time now. It was great to have you with us. I'm Tim. I'm from Amazon Web Services, so our goal really is to be the most uh, customer-centric company in the world and as such we offer you know over a hundred uh, services in our portfolio of services at this point. Very good. So Tim, it's been a little while since the GDPR regulations came into, into effect. Uh, what are you hearing from customers these days? You know it's a strange thing Wayne. Uh, leading up to the end of uh, May, um, more and more customers were asking questions. They wanted guidance on how to help with uh, GDPR compliance and so on. And as we got closer and closer and closer to you know, the end of May, that got more and more intense. And then after the end of May, we got into June, it's been silence. There's very few customers that want to talk about GDPR. Is that because they think it's gone away? Or what's, why, what do you put that down to? Uh, I, I think that they're waiting to see what happens in the landscape. Uh, you know, whether they get more insight into specific requirements around GDPR, mm -hmm. which will help them sort of formalize their GDPR programs and make sure they're implementing the right technologies, the right organizational measures, and so on. And I'm really interested if you guys are, are seeing the same thing. Yeah, Tony, what, what are you seeing? You, you deal with some interesting customers in your consultancy business. What are they telling you? Yeah, so I sort of see two speeds. People that are sort of sitting back, um, got very, you know, they've got programs in place for GDPR, but it's been quite sort of slow and, and measured. Mm. Um, and others who have been sort of busy implementing things, putting stuff in place. Um, and, you know, I think it all depends on the appetite of the organization, whether they're um, customer-centric, whether they're compliance-centric. Mm -hmm. If they're customer-centric, a lot of them have been looking to do, you know, they see it as part of their USP to be protecting and looking after their clients' data. Right. Whereas the ones who are compliance-centric, I would say, um, have been trying to do the bare minimum they can get away with. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Tanya. Well, we're still seeing a bit of confusion in that small and medium business market where they don't know whether they need to be complying to mm -hmm. GDPR. Um, and they're getting mixed messages even on courses where GDPR courses are being ran by, you know, lots of organizations now they're coming in and um, appearing everywhere. And those um, GDPR messages, sometimes you don't need to worry about it and don't worry about it. So, so we're seeing a lot of confusion out there. Um, and we were talking earlier, um, Tony and Tim and myself were talking earlier about if a company has gone through the data mapping process and they understand where their critical data is and their sensitive data is, then in some instances they're more GDPR ready because they've started locking down right. all that, um, you know, access to that information already. So. so that's clearly what they're struggling with. How are you able to help? So we, 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 we help in a number of ways. First of all, we, if they haven't already data mapped, we will go and put um, some software in and look at where the data is being had and how companies are currently interacting with it how, and their employees and now their workforce. What are they opening? What are they shifting? Where are they saving it? Mm -hmm. Is it just internally within the network or are they sending it out to Dropbox, et cetera? And then once you've got that in place, you're able to say, well, who needs access to this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, then we kind of spill in, it, 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 we help them in three areas. We help them with the, looking at their data compliance and execution of that. Because there's one thing having your systems and processes, you know, written down and mapped out. The other thing, the, other, the next stage is actually implementing that and that gets implemented through people and their behaviors. Right. Yeah? Uh, so that's very much where we focus on is the behaviors of the people. What are they doing? Are they doing things which are a risk? Mm -hmm. um, 
and what's the culture nurturing in terms of safety? Are they you know, nurturing a culture that is securing their data? Are they still nurturing a culture that, you know, in some degrees might be causing malicious threats as well? Right, right, right. You know? Yeah, yeah. Tony, what are people struggling with that they're calling you about? Oh, wow. Um, so it's a mixture from basically coming in to do a sort of compliance review and audit to see where they are in comparison to where GDPR requires them to be, um, and then giving them a sort of roadmap to actually providing data protection officers as a service. We've right. done that with a number of um, government and technical organisations that we work with. Um, which enables us then sort of, you know, to build that sort of best practice uh, sort of understanding of how to do these things. And, you know, again, we also do master classes in data mapping um, and things like that because of, you know, they're the people whose data is they need to understand. Um, and it, there are additional benefits from that. You know, if you understand wh where the data, what data is coming in, where it's going, what's being done to it, you can actually sort of improve um, efficiencies and within your own technical architectures and stuff. Right, right. Tim? People struggling, what are they asking AWS for? I think there's a couple of different uh, altitudes uh, of types of questions that we get. And so one of them really is they're trying to bootstrap their GDPR program. Uh, they don't have enough resources to do everything at once. And so they're looking for like help with strategy. W what should we approach first? Should we take some sort of risk-based approach or should we go right to our most critical systems or how should we really approach GDPR compliance? And then on the other hand, there's customers that have their program running, they have compliance programs, GDPR is part of that, and they're coming to us for help to accelerate that because, as you know, cloud is uh, synonymous with speed and agility and security and so on. And so they're looking to the cloud to help them accelerate this process. And so those are a lot of the discussions we have is how can you leverage the cloud in order to get GDPR compliance faster and, and to stay compliant into the future as more and more systems come online.